okay? Perfect. Thanks, Nicola. All right. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning to those of you that are joining us from the West Coast. I hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy during this uh, extraordinary time. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nicola Worsfold. I am a mother of a 13-year-old boy with Duchenne and the Director of Research and Advocacy here at Jesse's Journey. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining Jesse's Journey on our first webinar regarding COVID-19 and Duchenne. We're hosting this webinar today to facilitate your questions and provide families with the information regarding COVID-19 situation and how it is affecting our Duchenne community. So please note that you have been placed on mute to ensure that the quality of our audio throughout the webinar is good. So we ask that, that you um, do not unmute at any time during the call. So as Rochelle had mentioned earlier, your keyboard will become your voice. And at any time, if you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment, uh, just use the chat room that's located on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we will do our best to answer the questions that are shared in the chat room at the end of today's call. However, if we do run out of time, don't worry. We will be collecting all of our questions. Uh, and our expert panelists will provide answers that you can find on our website at jessiesjourney.com after today's webinar. And then finally, just a reminder, this webinar will be recorded, so you can share the information with your family and friends and anyone else you think might benefit from this. The video recording will be included uh, in closed captioning on YouTube, which you can also translate into any language as needed. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce our six experts on Duchenne and COVID-19 who have come together and generously given their time to us today to provide us with information to address the questions that many of you have sent ahead of time. So with us, we have Dr. Craig Campbell. He's a pediatric neurologist and director of the Neuromuscular uh, yes. Clinic at Children's Hospital, London Health Sciences, London, Ontario. Sorry, I'm just getting some background there. Everything okay? Okay. We also have Dr. Jean Ma, pediatric neurologist and director of the neuromuscular program at Alberta Children's Hospital from Calgary, Alberta. We have Dr. Jordan Sharico, pediatric physiatrist and medical director of pediatric rehabilitation at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dr. Aaron O'Farrell, adult neurologist at the Montreal Neurological Hospital in Montreal. Dr. Rafika Ursu, pediatric respirologist at uh, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa. And Dr. Karina Topp, an infectious disease specialist at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So welcome panelists and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, without further ado, I will, we will now begin our topics with Dr. Toth, our infectious disease specialist, to give us an update on the Canadian situation with COVID-19. So thank you, Dr. Toth. I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to speak with you guys today about COVID-19. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have become more and more familiar about COVID-19 and coronaviruses over the last um, little, the last several weeks, but uh, just for some background, so COVID-19, um, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, um, is uh, caused by a, a type of virus called coronavirus. The virus itself is referred to as SARS-CoV-2. And this disease was first identified in patients in Wuhan, China, in late December um, when they noticed an increase in patients being hospitalized with severe uh, viral pneumonia. And eventually, within a few weeks, actually, they identified the virus that was causing it. Um, so coronaviruses are something that are actually very, um, we're very familiar with as humans. Um, they do cause, there's types of coronaviruses that cause common colds. Um, mm -hmm and circulate through, you know, the spring and fall. Most people would just have a mild cold, runny nose, cough, but in patients who have underlying respiratory disease, immune deficiency, or other conditions, um, and potentially Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, then they could be at risk of more severe infection from those norm regular coronaviruses, including pneumonia. Um, but this is a, a different type of 
virus, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID. Um, it's closely related to SARS, a severe acute respiratory syndrome um, virus that caused a big outbreak back, way back in 2003 um, that affected Toronto very seriously. Um, and that was uh, similarly caused, so similar to that, it causes a, uh, can cause pneumonia. Um, but um, unlike the original SARS or the first SARS, um, the COVID uh, tends to, uh, does have a lower mortality rate. So it's overall seems to be around 2%, but it does vary quite a bit from place to place. Um, and it also spreads much more easily than um, the old SARS um, because the original SARS had, you know, several thousand cases and was restricted yes. to a, a few countries. But um, SARS-CoV-2 now, um, we're approaching about close to a million cases worldwide in over 200 countries. Um, and the disease seems to be most severe in older adults, um, especially elderly people, um, men, elderly men in particular, and people with um, older adults with chronic underlying conditions. But we are seeing some severe disease in younger people. Um, so the next slide. So in Canada, uh, the first case of COVID was identified um, in late January in BC, and then um, there was a cluster of cases there, and then in Ontario, and now has spread. We actually just crossed, I just checked the numbers before this call, and we've just crossed 10,000 cases um, across the country um, in 10 provinces and two territories. Um, and as of this morning, there were over three, there had been over 300 patients who'd been admitted to the ICU and 111 deaths, but those are all in adults. We're not aware of any pediatric deaths so far. Um, and most, the cases, most cases now are related to community transmission, which means people picking it up from other people who are infected um, in their own um, communities and neighborhoods, um, and the, about a third of cases in total related to travel. But this varies a lot. So where I am in Nova Scotia, we still haven't seen um, much in the way of community transmission. Um, and that's probably true for most of the Maritimes. But um, in the major cities like Toronto and Vancouver, there's certainly a lot of community transmission. Uh, next slide. So uh, this slide just shows the the, the age groups, um, the breakdown by age across the country. So um, I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist. Um, so I'm you know mostly uh, only see children. Uh, so children have there's been only four percent of the cases so far. So about 400 cases have been reported in children and no deaths. Uh, and then. We're, but we are seeing um, most cases are in people of middle age or, or older. Um, next uh, slide. Um, and in children, the disease tends to be, um, most kids will have fairly mild disease. Many kids have no symptoms whatsoever. Um, overall, we're seeing about less than one. The data, the studies we have so far, mostly out of China, suggest that among children, um, we might have as high as 5% to 1 in 20 that get admitted to hospital, but less than 1 in 100 that need intensive care. And yep. mortality is rare, probably less than 1 in 10,000. But again, um, it's still uh, early days. Uh, so just go back in terms of the symptoms. So um, most common that you're hearing about are fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, but you can all, we also see sore throat, runny nose. People can have quite significant weakness and, and fatigue, just general weakness. Um, we, some people will have um, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, and others are, are complaining of muscle, joint, and chest pain. Um, and a few people will have um, no symptoms at all. So it ranges from no symptoms to very severe disease. Like I said, in kids, for the most part, it's been milder disease. So in children with chronic medical conditions, um, severe disease, um, like I said, is rare. Um, but we, we expect that children with neurologic, respiratory, um, and other immune deficiency and other underlying conditions may be at um, higher risk of uh, severe disease. But um, there's very, very few published reports so far. So we really are just beginning to learn about this. There has been. Certainly, kids with severe disease with who had underlying leukemia um, and uh, kidney disease um, haven't 
heard of reports of, of severe disease in kids with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but again, I, I think for in Europe and North America, people are just um, being currently in, in, right in the midst of, of this outbreak, and uh, the, so there's going to be a bit of delay before we, we have they're able to share their data. Um, we do know in adults that underlying conditions like immune deficiency, respiratory disease, and high blood pressure are associated with more um, severe uh, COVID and higher risk of, of ICU care. Um, and currently, there's no treatments available, unfortunately. There's a number, uh, there's no proven treatments that work against this virus. There are uh, many um, clinical trials currently underway, primarily in adults, and there are plans in, in Canada. Um, they are working on getting trials up and running that will include children to test some of the drugs that you might have heard about in the news, like hydroxychloroquine um, and lipinavir, ritonavir, among others. Um, but uh, at this point, there aren't any um, proven treatments. So the main treatment for this, if you get COVID, is what we call supportive care, so supporting breathing, um, nutrition, fluid intake, um, and ventilation is needed. So, um, and next slide. Uh, so really, you know, we've you're hearing a lot in the news and from public health and your probably your own clinical care teams about prevention is the key. So, staying at home, um, and that means, you know, really, you know, the social distancing, staying six feet away from people. Um, that means that really it should be only, you know, immediate family. Um, immediate house members in the household, no visitors, no going to visit other people, no going to playgrounds, um, no like ball hockey in the street. Um, the family unit is, is the only people that you should be having um, close contact with. Um, if, and they're recommending to sort of designate one person who goes and does groceries and, and errands and otherwise everyone should stay close to home. Um, except to go out for, you know, a walk around the neighborhood, again, staying more than six feet away from people, from other people, um, that is okay. But we're, you know, most of the parks and trails and stuff have been closed because those are places where it's, it's hard not to be closer than six meters or six feet away from other people. Um, you know, you heard, heard a lot about hand washing. The best hand washing is soap and water. It's better than hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer should just be used if you don't have soap and water available, and you should wash your hands with uh, soap and water up for at least 20 seconds. Doing that before, like, after getting in the house, before and after handling food, obviously after going to the bathroom or doing respiratory care, all those sorts of things, um, all of those times are moments to wash your hands. And then cleaning common surfaces, so the virus spreads through droplet, cough, sneezes, um, and those droplets can land on surfaces like light switches, doorknobs, countertops, and so cleaning those surfaces with common household cleaner um, you, doesn't have to be anything special, just a common household cleaner um, every day um, will help. So that's, um, that's the introduction for me, so I'll turn it back. Thank you, Dr. Top. That was very informative um, and appreciate that update. Uh, prevention is definitely key and, and proper hygiene, uh, very important. So thank you for that. Uh, just a reminder uh, for those participants who have joined the call, if you aren't on mute, if you wouldn't mind just muting your, your phones or your computers just to minimize some of the background noise, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're going to move over to Dr. Craig Campbell, who's going to provide us with an update on COVID-19 in the pediatric Duchenne population. Dr. Campbell? Yeah, thanks, um, Nicholas. So, uh, Craig Campbell, I'm a child neurologist in London, and and um, I was asked to talk about how uh, COVID-19 has, you know, impacted the pediatric uh, DMD community, and 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 really, when I try and answer that question, you can go to the next uh, slide, Nicola. Um, really, I feel that uh, there's not much that it hasn't changed. I mean, our whole um, 
you know, lives have been flipped around because of this. And I think it's especially the case um, for everyone uh, in the DMD community. And I'm, you know, I've listed a number of things here uh, that I'm going to go into some detail, but you can see really right from the, you know, the risk to, uh, to, to someone who, who has uh, DMD, you know, the, the risk to their own health, right through to things like financial uh, issues, relationships in the home, and, and uh, research study participation have all, been, um, have all been affected. So I'm going to touch on a couple of those things. Can you go to the next one? Um, great. So uh, just starting with direct risk to health and, and sort of usual uh, healthcare pathways that are now disrupted. We, we do recognize that um, people with DMD are, uh, you know, technically immunocompromised. Um, that's due to the fact that too many uh, of the boys are on uh, steroids and also maybe in a stage of, of DMD where their lung function is weak as well. So I think, you know, just as a general statement, I think you, when you're looking at information, you should consider uh, that um, your uh, boy with DMD is, has this term immunocompromised, which means their immune system is is less than optimal. The other thing that, of course, you know, everyone's worried about is is encounters with the hospital and going directly to emerge if if not necessary. And of course, that is um, an important point. And and we've already talked about you know really taking precautions seriously. On the next slide. Um, I want to just show a couple of, uh, of things I, I really want people to be um, keenly aware of. The first is, is um, despite the fact that steroid treatment does lead to uh, this element of being immunocompromised, it is important not to come off of uh, steroid treatment, either deflazacort or prednisone or any other regimen that you're on. I know I, know I get that question a lot. Um, but coming off uh, can lead to serious difficulties um, uh, due to a lack of the body's own ability to produce steroid, and that can make you very sick. So despite seeing that steroids can weaken your immune system, it is important not to stop them. And in fact, if your child gets sick, you may need more uh, uh, steroids. And so we talk about um, this um, need to add stress dosing for steroids sometimes. And so if your child is sick, you need to talk to your neuromuscular team um, uh, about doing that. And then the final thing I'll just note here is you'll see some reports that um, some sometimes people are thinking of using steroids uh, in the setting of COVID lung infection. And, and other people have asked me, should I be taking more just to prevent it? That is not a preventative strategy. The bottom line is here, just stay on your current steroid uh, regimen. Many centers uh, have developed a, an emergency diversion clinic. So that's a way to not have to present to the emergency department if you are someone who is on steroid or immunocompromised. We've done that here in London. Uh, and I imagine many other centers across the country uh, want to keep people who um, have a higher risk out of the, the emergency. So please, before you call, come to hospital, call your neuromuscular specialist or one of the subspecialists involved in your care and see if there's a way to uh, access one of these diversion strategies. And then, and then, of course, taking the precautions seriously, which we've talked about. So we can go to the next slide there. Closures closures and recreational closures have really um, led to, I, I think, you know, one of the um, quiet, uh, huge impacts of this um, thing. I think many people are dealing with social isolation. Their learning in school is, is interrupted. And for, for many of the boys at the MD, that's, that's a really important, um, you know, part of their, their activities. That, that often is the loss of physiotherapy intervention um, and stretching regimens. It can lead to increased conflict uh, with parents and siblings and caregiver burnout. I worry about uh, things like weight gain because when you're sitting at home, not having a lot to do, it's easy to um, food. Yeah, of course, risk 
schools. And the other thing I didn't include in here, uh, but should, is um, changes or disruption of the sleep wake cycle. And I certainly, I have a teenage boy, and I've seen um, his situation since uh, school's been out, um, where, you know, staying up later, getting up later, uh, leads to real disruption. So you can go to the next slide there. Um, so it's really important to continue to establish a routine of learning, uh, provide incentives and find ways to continue stretching and range of uh, motion um, uh, exercises. Please think carefully about setting some, you know, firm uh, or strict eating parameters and thinking about diet now. You don't wanna come out at the end of this with an extra 10, 15, 20 pounds on board uh, because you know we, we didn't think about it right away. And then with lots of other kids and activities and everyone in the house, please be aware of risk for falls. You know falls can lead to fractures and fractures leads to loss of ambulation. And so please do a careful scan around the house for those uh, fall risks. And also please work on proper sleep hygiene. Keep that as, as close to normal as uh, possible. Next slide. Uh, of course, we've lost social supports and, and you know, heightened anxiety. We, oui. we, many of the uh, boys toi. in the UFC have, um, oh. have oh, already Anxiety. Someone, someone can just put on mute there. They're talking. Um, Hello, <laughs> someone can put on a mute. Hi there. Sorry, we can hear you. If, if everyone could just check their phone. Oh. Nicola, it's Rochelle. I'm going to mute everyone and then. Pitbull de directrice adjointe, là, fait que ça va déjà mieux. Fait que comment ça se passe là-bas? Can you hear me there, Nicola? Hi, Craig. It's Rochelle. I can hear you. There's okay. still somebody uh, on mute or unmuted talking in French. Um, so I'm just going to mute oh, everyone cool. and then I'm going to unmute you and uh, Nicola Craig. Just give me two seconds. Okay, thanks. Ben, je vais aller peut-être y porter une oreiller, mais je vais attendre que les filles soient couchées. Texte, texte la don, voir comment elle va. Okay. okay. So, it's Craig Campbell back here. Um, uh, uh, so, so, the issues with social support and heightened anxiety, I think, are important for uh, DMD boys. Uh, there is a oui, higher oui. risk of anxiety oui. issues there. And um, comment? So, so, this sorry i think what's happening is um it's somebody on their phone uh and they probably don't realize they're not on mute so my apologies everybody just bear with us for one second Do um, you know, you just keep talking through can people hear me just like louder despite that hello this is jose la rochelle oh. à la personne qui parle au téléphone on vous entend fait que combien de cas depuis okay. hier? Yeah, I think they're on the telephone. 900 cas, j'ai cru comprendre. I know who it is, so I'll try to contact them. Oh, uh, perfect, Rudy. thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay. So I'll just try and talk through that. Hopefully people can, if I talk loudly, hopefully people can um, hear me okay. okay. So, Thanks, so, Greg. Um, so this is a real concern for, for us. And if Hello? you go to okay, the slide, bye -bye. Nicola, um, you know, the, the realities are that, 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 that no, there is a lot to be anxious for right what's now, but if you already have underlying anxiety, ah, non, non, moi, je, that can really escalate quite uh, significantly and quite And I think that many um, people will find that you know, some of their social supports aren't there or some of the um, uh, respite that one might normally um, use. Uh, will will disappear. So I think some some keys to decreasing um, the, the anxiety include limiting media exposure to COVID um, activity. Ben we can't avoid it. All on mute a bit of a time each day okay. to Bye. what's going on um, and answer your child's questions is important. But many kids with anxiety really perseverate on this all day and will seek reassurance all, all the time. And I think if you put some boundaries around that, it'll be helpful. 
giving kids a good sense of control around that. So, you know, if they have a, the ability to wipe down their surfaces, participate in that, even have a little measuring tape or something as a distancer, so they can feel in charge of some of their health care. And then, of course, modeling your anxiety, uh, for, you know, properly for your child. And, and um, you know, I know my first tendency is to flick on the TV and understand what's happening. But I think if you can, you know, keep it all um, in a, you know, as best as possible in a healthy, contained way, that your, your child will pick up on that. Some communities have uh, developed uh, virtual consult services for behavioral consultants or psychologists. And so look into that in your community if you're struggling. But either way, find help if you're if things are getting um, if you, if things are getting out of control, both for yourself and for your uh, child um, or young adult with DMD. You can go to the next slide. Um, research, uh, this will be uh, not for many of you, but there are uh, some families who participate in research studies. Please know that most new clinical research activity has been put on hold. So many studies that are just starting up are, are now right now not enrolling. But if you are on a current, um, or sorry, but some that do have potential benefits are, are um, continuing to screen and enroll. Um, at our site, we found ways to um, to uh, still start some studies and enroll children in those. But if you are part of an ongoing study, please remember, despite the concerns, you still have to um, get access to some of these important medications that you're on, on a study, and you need to um, report any safety concerns. And so in some circumstances, you know, you will have to go to the hospital for study visits or find an alternative method. And most of us are working with um, our study teams to find what those alternatives are. If you haven't heard from your study team and you are on a study, please reach out to them to find how these things are going to be managed. If you can go to the next slide there. Um, and please remember to continue to report safety issues, uh, even if it's by phone. That's critically important in this uh, time. And many places, including here in London, we've revamped our process so that we now have a, a separate pathway for clinical research units. So you can go directly there rather than having to go into um, potentially unsafe clinical uh, areas in the hospital. Go ahead. Uh, next slide. And so with that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop there. I'll say, please take care. And we're happy to try and field the rest of the questions in the open forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, would you like to now provide your perspective from the adult population? Hi, this is Erin Thank you for inviting me. So I'm an adult. I work in Montreal at mainly the McGill hospitals, but also the Centre de Redaptation Lucie. Oh. Uh, large Dr. Farrell, sorry, can you hear me? These patients are. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Farrell, sorry, yeah, uh, you're just kind of going in and out a little bit, so the audio is not not great. Uh, just just a heads up. Oh, yeah, you're going in and out. Okay. You want me uh, to switch might be to your the internet. telephone? Um, if 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 there's enough time, it sounds okay now. Just I don't know if your internet. Maybe a little wonky. That's why it's going in and out a little bit. But um, maybe we, we'll keep going, and I'll let you know if it gets really bad. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Okay. So um, I'm I'm gonna say a couple words to our French attendees as well. Bonjour. Et les questions en français. Oh. Point slide. So here in Quebec, we have been using um, this uh, rainbow. Sorry, can we go back one slide? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So we've been using this uh, rainbow to lift our spirits here in Quebec. So for example, um, if you go walking through the streets of Montreal, you'll see that many children have drawn the rainbow and put it in their windows to try to um, encourage people. I've seen a few even in the, the windows of businesses as well. So there's a there's a sense of we're in this together, and I think that that's true uh, across Canada. So uh, next slide, please. So adults have some of the same issues that Dr. Campbell just described, but we have um, maybe some issues that are a little bit more 
specific to the adult population. So often my adult uh, DMD patients have more care needs due to advanced weakness. So they might have more equipment in the homes. They might have, um, uh, you know, people moving machines. Um, more workers may be involved in the care or more help for, for daily activities. Some of the DMD patients, of course, have ventilation use, and it's going to be more widespread in the adult population. And the, the cardiac complications become more important as the patients age. And the cardiologists are more involved and, and more often are, are treating patients with medications. And then, of course, as we all age, uh, we tend to develop other medical problems that may be related either to chronic steroid use or just other medical problems um, based on our, our genetics. So uh, we deal a lot with osteoporosis, but also diabetes, chronic pain, other uh, medical issues. One of the big challenges for us in the adult community is that the healthcare resources really aren't centralized at a, the way they were at the children's hospital. So um, although all the, the services are, are usually still there, they're more spread out. So for example, here in Montreal, we have a separate home ventilation clinic, which is attached to the uh, respiratory therapist, respirologist. Um, some of the services um, can come through the, the individual health care centers, we call them CLSCs here. And then the hospitals and the rehab centers also provide some care. So I'm gonna move to the next slide. So COVID-19 has brought uh, many challenges for our adult patients, and some of these are, are certainly not specific um, to adults, but have affected the children as well. So I'm just going to review the ones that are most important here. Mm -hmm. So, for example, clinic visits to family physicians and specialists are now limited here in Montreal to um, urgent cases. This is going to vary uh, across the country. Oh, so at different times in different places, you may or may not have access to in-person visits. So the solution there is really to start using um, telephone visits and televisits and, and know that even though um, doctors are not seeing patients in person or, or may not be, there's still access via phone and through other platforms as well. So the, the pharmacies and grocery stores, what we're finding here, are, are more in demand. And we had some creative ways of, ways of dealing with that. So um, aside from grocery and pharmacy delivery services, some of our um, services are provided for special hours for high risk patients. So if you or a family member has DMD, consider taking advantage of that and, and going, you know, sometimes they open the grocery store an hour early or have it um, open an hour later uh, to make it a little bit less crowded and, and safer. Um, stress, anxiety, and caregiver burnout, as Dr. Campbell mentioned, is a, is a big problem. Um, but again, don't forget to reach out. So there's still lots of social supports that are available by phone um, or by web. So especially in the adult population, the respiratory complications um, can be important if, if our patients get infected. So it's super important to follow the, the public health guidelines. So self-isolate, good hand hygiene, Try to do everything you can to stay in good health. So take your medications as they're prescribed, eat and sleep well. And if you have a, a cough assist or you've been instructed already to do um, respiratory exercises, this is not the time to stop doing them. So if, if, you, ha if you have those instructions, please, please follow them. Next slide, please. So... I'm just emphasizing the practical advice we've heard already. So the hand washing we've gone over. Um, don't forget, we are here for you. So even though um, we are not necessarily seeing patients in person, we are available. And keep in mind that the normal pathways for care might not be the same pathways now. So if you have a problem that's maybe not emergent, you don't need to you know, call an ambulance, please check first as to what the solution is for your area. So for example, um, uh, Dr. Campbell also already mentioned some diversion clinics here in Montreal. We have we have uh, slightly different ways of, of dealing with it, but you might not go to the emergency department if you have a problem. There might be a better solution for you. And if you have COVID symptoms, there's usually a distinct pathway as well. So always check with your, your local authorities and the public health uh, website before you, you go anywhere. And because it's so important, I'm going to say it again here, um, don't stop your steroids. So there is both um, evidence for and against steroids on the effects of COVID, and the experts have all been unanimous in saying that it's, it's important not to stop your steroids. 
Um, if you're on steroids, stay on them. It's not a good time to run out, um, not only because the risk of adrenal insufficiency, but you want your muscles to be as strong as possible if you were to get infected and you should stay on your, your current doses. The same applies to the heart medication. So there's been some debate whether ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers could have some effect on COVID. Some, some debate says positive, some negative, but overall, all the um, cardiac associations have also been unanimous in saying that this is not the time to stop these medications. They may be beneficial. Uh, stay on them if, if you're prescribed them. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to end a little bit on a positive note. So what can we learn from COVID and, and what, what can we get out of this that, that will you know, bring something positive from this whole uh, very difficult experience? So I think already I'm learning that we can be very creative and do things differently. I think even after COVID, we're probably going to have better access and use of telemedicine and alternative methods of, of communication. I've definitely seen immense creativity at the hospitals and among patients of ways of solving problems that maybe I wouldn't have thought of before. And of course, there's more time for families. So many families are, are at home together. I think we should really um, make use of this time. And I, always when I'm feeling uh, depressed, you can just put caremongering and Canadians into Google and read great articles about how um, other Canadians are helping each other. So of course, everyone has to still respect the, the public health guidelines about keeping distances, but um, don't, be, don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. There's, there's people out there and societies out there that can, can help you. So I think I'm going to end at uh, that, on that note. I'm happy to answer uh, questions in English ou en français après la présentation. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. Um, Nicola, are you able to hear me? Sorry. Yes, my apologies. I put myself on mute and I was talking to myself. So No problem. Just a reminder about the background noise. We're still having somebody uh, on the line that we're able to hear you speak in French uh, in the background. So please just be mindful. It does say that everyone is on mute. Uh, so uh, I believe uh, the system might be playing a few tricks on us. Uh, it does say that you're on mute, but in fact, we can hear you. Uh, so please, uh, if you happen to be having another conversation in French, uh, please uh, just make sure that uh, we can uh, make sure that you are in mute or you might have to leave the uh, webinar and come back in to make sure that everything is working okay. So Nicola, sorry, I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, Dr. Jordan Sharico, who is going to uh, share, share some strategies at home and for remote care. Jordan, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Nicola, and um, thanks to everybody else that's given some fantastic tips before. So I just wanted to address a few um, issues that might be coming up. Um, and as uh, Dr. O'Farrell was alluding to, um, there's likely in your area more and more opportunities for accessing care in a different way that, um, that all of us are, are often learning. Um, and uh, those remote care options may include um, telephone facilitated visits or video based uh, visits using a variety of different platforms and technologies. Um, and that's really an, an effort to try to provide what care is, is still possible through those means um, while also allowing um, patients and families to stay at home. And also, um, there may be some care providers that uh, are needed to maintain isolation as this pandemic progresses. So um, it gives a little bit of flexibility. And, and I, I do also hope that uh, this will be one of the lasting impacts from this pandemic is that we do have better um, access to remote uh, care um, as, as things progress. Um, certainly the options that are going to be available to you and your healthcare team are going to vary depending on the region that you're located in. And I think it's really important that you that you discuss what your needs are, you know, both uh, clinical questions or care questions um, that you have with your healthcare team and, and how those could be best addressed. Um, 
and I think it's also important for people to remember that you you, you need to feel comfortable um, and consent to a virtual care visit. Um, and I think it's important as well that you are aware of how your privacy is going to be protected. And these are um, different means of accessing uh, care, and so just make sure that you feel comfortable with those. We'll just go to the next slide, Nicholas. <coughs> Um, a couple of tips uh, to think about to make remote care uh, or, <laughs> or video-based platforms um, go smoothly. Um, choose a space um, within your home or wherever you are where you can talk freely. So think about a space that's uh, private in your room uh, or in your home. Uh, thinking about reducing or eliminating any potential background noise. So think about things like pets, TV, radio, other children, or outdoor noise. Make sure that when you do um, attend a virtual visit that you set yourself up in a comfortable space. So think about how long your visit might last for and where you're going to be comfortable. Consider as well, if you, particularly if you're using um, video-based uh, service, what your background is going to be. Um, you may want to move around some personal items or things like that. Uh, so just think about that. Um, and particularly if um, your healthcare team is wanting to use some video so that um, they can um, have a bit of a physical assessment um, through video-based means, ensure that your lighting is really appropriate. So some things that can work well are, are having lights and windows in front of you if possible. And as well, trying to posi position the camera at eye level so that um, we're getting a good online visit. Sometimes to improve your sound quality, headphones with a microphone uh, can be helpful if it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, visit. Uh, of course, if, um, if it's a child and family that are participating um, in the visit together, um, then you'll have to rely on your computer's um, speakers and microphone. Um, visits in general would not be recorded, although many of the platforms do have this ability. Um, but you can ask your provider about the option of recording, um, and this may be an option so that you can share this with other family members that aren't able uh, to participate in the appointment um, as they may otherwise. Uh, and so depending on the platform and, and what region you are, that could be an option. So just discuss that with your healthcare provider. Um, and given that uh, most of these um, options are you know, new for both clinicians and uh, patients and their families, thinking about testing the platform ahead of time. So um, particularly if you're using a web-based um, option, your clinic likely will be giving you instructions um, through an email ahead of time. So think about logging on um, uh, and testing that out and then um, thinking about this. As sorry, a... sorry, sorry, uh, Dr. Shiriko. Okay. Um, Whoever is uh, on the phone, if, if you wouldn't mind, please putting yourself on mute. Um, it's sort of disrupting uh, our, our uh, vocal of uh, Dr. Shiriko. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone's patience as uh, as we work through this. Uh, sorry about that, Dr. Shiriko. Please continue. No problem. Um, so think about any virtual visit as a typical um, in-person scheduled appointment. So uh, logging on 15 minutes before the scheduled appointment to make sure everything is, is ready and that uh, you're ready um, to go for your appointment time. We can go to the next slide. Um, so building on a little bit to what uh, some of the other panelists have talked about in terms of, you know, how do we make the most out of um, the situation that we all find ourselves in? And physical activity um, is often talked about as, a, as an important aspect of maintaining the health of all of us. Um, and that certainly uh, we're all much more challenged to find ways to maintain physical activity uh, during the pandemic. A couple of sort of things that I've, I've thought about and, and you can hopefully think about is uh, setting a daily goal for yourself and challenging your family members um, and as well as friends. You can think about doing this virtually um, and that gives you some tangible things to be working on on a daily basis. Obviously, what you're able to do for physical activity is going to depend on uh, you or your child's level of function, uh, the space that you have in your environment, and, and of course, what um, access to equipment that you might have. Um, and 
for those that um, you know do have access to technology and the and the internet, there really are a lot of options um, for home-based workouts. So there are many op- opportunities before the pandemic um, that you could find online and through YouTube and social media channels. Things like yoga, dance, body weight uh, workouts, and uh, I think even more so now during the pandemic, um, many local uh, gyms um, have been putting out uh, daily workouts and things like that. Um, so, uh, so think about what you would do, typically do for your routine. Uh, look online, look through what uh, what's available in your community, um, and uh, think about what you enjoy to do. Remember, of course, that physical activity really. Um, at all times should be individualized for any of our patients with machines and we should be avoiding the activity that causes muscle pain. Um, uh, as we've talked about as well, prevention um, of, of COVID-19 is, is very important. And so making sure that we're really respecting social distancing, um, but that if you can, while respecting that, um, get outside in your neighborhood, uh, go for a walk, getting fresh air and getting some sunlight um, can be really helpful for physical activity as well as our general well-being. Um, and if you are certainly feeling stuck, your healthcare team is a, uh, should be a really great resource for providing ideas and suggestions that are tailored for you. So we can go to the next slide, Nicola. So um, what else do we do at home? Um, and as other people have alluded to, this is a challenging and difficult time for all of us. And so some general tips I think that can help is, um, is in general, keep to a schedule for your days and, and weeks and plan that out uh, together as a family, making sure you're including time for school and learning activities. And these don't have to be uh, necessarily traditional things, but um, thinking about uh, what you can learn uh, around your neighborhood um, and in different ways ways. Of course, as we talked about, schedule some time for physical activity, mindfulness, um, as Dr. Campbell was mentioning as well, nutrition is really important. So thinking about cooking and food um, and perhaps doing something together as a family or learning a new skill. Uh, connecting with friends and family is really important, even if we can't do that physically in person as we're used to doing, uh, using different means uh, to make sure that we're still maintaining those connections. Of course, for our children, play is, is um, incredibly important and as well as having unstructured time. So making sure that there's a balance of that throughout the day. As always, of course, set reasonable limits on screen time. This is a, uh, whenever there's a time of increased stress and challenge, uh, screen, extra screen time can be kind of an easy fallback, um, but, but be mindful of uh, setting reasonable limits on that. Making sure that we're checking in on everybody's coping and well-being um, is, is really important. Um, And I I think it's, in addition to kind of screen time, I think it's also important that we're making sure that we're setting limits and boundaries on uh, news that we're consuming in social media that can eat up a lot of uh, time, but also um, build on some of the the worries and challenges. So we need to be staying informed. So uh, decide what um, are the sources that you're going to uh, be checking on a a regular basis and, and then save time for other things. Make sure as well that you're validating, particularly in our children, the complex thoughts, emotions, and grief that we all are experiencing throughout this time. And then discuss and look for solutions for how we make the most out of this time. There are um, some things that are good about this, as as we've talked about. uh, It's likely a time of increased um, uh, time for family units to be together. And so uh, try to make the most out of those those opportunities. Um, And so I think I'll leave that um, at that point. Um, Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. So we will now move over to uh, Dr. Rafika Ursu, who is going to provide us with her recommendations for children requiring respiratory support. Uh, Just a reminder to everyone again, so please check uh, your cameras, your computer, and your cell phones. Uh, Make sure that you are on mute um, so that we can all hear our speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ursu. Hello. 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 Um, good to talk to you, everyone. I'm part of the neuromuscular team and also a home ventilation program uh, here at uh, CHIO. Uh, so um, I think I'll add a few sentences to what already has been discussed and uh, try to answer some questions. Uh, one of the things that I want to remind that um, recommendations have been changing. So we are a letter to all our neuromuscular uh, patients uh, regarding the recommendations 
COVID uh, prevention and also taking care of their equipment and how to uh, approach illnesses. But uh, this was sent last week and even uh, today there are many changes to this. So we recommend uh, to follow the uh, reputable websites. So there's a lot of information at your website and of course on Minister of Health and our public health. Uh, and uh, of course I agree with all the preventive uh, measures that the speakers before me have. Uh, we would also uh, advocate uh, like the previous uh, speakers not uh, going to the uh, hospital or emergency department visits unless uh, if the healthcare team, team, team thinks that it's necessary, or of course you have to. Uh, but our first recommendation is of course to have symptoms, if you have symptoms, to contact the healthcare team. Uh, so in our clinic, we also have been doing the uh, visits and sometimes video visits as well. Uh, and if there are issues that we cannot resolve over the phone, uh, then we will uh, do a visit so that the patient uh, does not need to go to the emergency room and we try to address those issues. So I think those are all uh, necessary steps that we need to take in this time of... So if you could go to the next slide, please, Nicola. Uh, so there are a lot of recommendations for home ventilator patients, either non-invasive or invasive. And there's a recent task force, uh, which one of the neuromuscular um, uh, care doctors here at CHIO, Dr. Uh, Katz. Uh, and uh, so there are these are recommendations for both adults and children who have uh, underlying neuromuscular disease and who are on the home uh, respiratory support. So those include uh, how to even how to make disposable cleaning wipes at home uh, when uh, you have a shortage of supply of those kind of things, but include the limit of uh, the limiting the spread of infectious particles and you're using the respiratory uh, equipment and caring for the uh, ventilation device. Uh, and also suctioning devices uh, and recommendation on preventing secondary infections uh, while you're taking care of your equipment. Uh, so there are some um, clues to that uh, and recommendations. Uh, and then also uh, we have some recommendations for people with tracheostomy to decrease uh, both the rate of infections uh, and also to take care of the equipment. So this is uh, the link that you have on the screen, and this is meant for the patients. Uh, so I, if you're on any uh, support, uh, I would strongly recommend you to go on that side. And if there are any changes, those will be updated. So I think that's uh, better than to have a, uh, it's better to have a live document in this time when things are changing constantly. Uh, I think the last thing that I want to say is that uh, I think it's very important that you bring your equipment with you when you go uh, to the hospital uh, with a possibility of admission. Uh, so that includes the uh, cough assist device and the non-invasive ventilator uh, or the ventilator because there may be shortages at the hospital. They may not use it. They may not need it. And at this time, we do not have the sh any shortages. But it's always a good practice uh, to take your equipment. Maybe there may be some changes to the equipment. You may be needing higher pressures uh, or different settings. Uh, so it would be a good practice uh, to take the equipment with you. I think that's all I have to say now. And I have questions that I will um, be addressing, but I think that's for later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ursu. And just uh, so everyone knows, the um, link that we provided here on the slide deck is also available on our resource page on our website. Um, so in case anyone's frantically trying to write that down. <laughs> uh, so thank you. And uh, just a reminder, if you don't mind putting yourself back on mute, Dr. Ursu, that would be fantastic.
Um, so the last portion of this call was going to um, address some frequently asked questions um, that have come in that may not have been already covered by our panelists throughout uh, the webinar. Uh, Dr. Ma was, is going to uh, bring us through that, but I just want to do a quick time check, and I see that we are getting close to the end of this call. And so I want to be mindful um, that we do get an opportunity to address all our questions. Uh, if we aren't able to address them on this call, Call during this webinar, we will be providing the answers to all of your questions that you have submitted on our resource page after this, along with the recording of the call. So um, don't, um, don't worry if we don't get to those questions now. Um, so did we want to do a, just a quick check of the chat box uh, to see if there's anything there, uh, Rochelle or, or Dr. Ma? Oh, hi everyone. This is uh, Dr. Jean Ma from Calgary. I went through the chat box and I didn't see any new questions, but feel free to continue to, to send us any questions that you may have so that we can try to address it either um, now or, or later on as a follow-up. I'm going to read out um, one of the questions um, that has been posted before. If you are a parent and you have been away on a trip for 14 days, uh, is that a safe enough time to quarantine yourself or, or do you have to do it longer in case you get it from groceries or, or car services? I think that 14 days of quarantine is what is is recommended standard if you've been traveling outside of the country. Um, if you have to travel as part of your work, um, then of course you have to re-quarantine yourself. Um, just bring it down to whatever you can as as share parents of children um, at this time and, and do your best just to practice the, the, the distancing if you are concerned um, and also uh, practice good hand hygiene, washing your hands um, before going out and coming back from grocery shopping or any, anything like work related. Self-isolation, does that apply only to our son uh, with DMD or for everyone? I, I think that as you have heard from this panel of um, excellent speakers, that we all have to practice uh, good hand hygiene and that we have to maintain our distance. Uh, there are no other special precautions that we can recommend at this time. There are lots of websites or touting special therapies or medications, and they have not been proven. And as a matter of fact, they are false information. And sometimes unproven medications can have side effects. So just be aware, aware of that. I think your local grocery store, this is a question about any extra precautions. I think that they, they are working with you to minimize the number of people in, 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 the, uh, in the store, the distancing and so on. So just follow their advice and please be patient with everyone. I'm going to say that as far as we know, um, and, and at, at the present time, we are all sharing the same concerns for our uh, patients and, and families, family members with uh, muscular dystrophy. I do think that the, the work situation is going to be in flux right now. If you are able to work, and work is essential for you know maintaining your, your household expenses and so on, um, I, I would say that it is fine to continue to work. Um, just place yourself in social distancing with your colleagues at work. Uh, wash your hands frequently and do the same when you are at home. And I think that that's the best that we can do right now. Can we move to the last slide, please, for questions? I do think that question number nine is worth talking about. Uh, the question is, should individuals with DMD get the pneumonia vaccine and any other vaccines? So the question here uh, goes, uh, um, goes back to the, the standard of care current recommendations for um, individuals with muscular dystrophy, including DMD. And the, re the recommendation is that uh, um, such individuals and ourselves, we should always get the annual flu shot. As far as the pneumococcal vaccine, uh, it depends on whether uh, your, your child or yourself have received the pneumococcal vaccine uh, before. And there are two types of pneumococcal vaccine. There is a conjugated vaccine that is usually the first one to get and followed by the um, polysaccharide, the 
the 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine that is recommended as a second prevention against this bacteria, pneumococcal bacteria, to prevent against chest infection or pneumonia. This pneumococcal vaccine, the 23 valent, uh, can be offered again uh, at least five years after the last um, pneumococcal vaccine um, uh, was administered. Um, right now, the problem is how to get these vaccines when the health clinic and public health are just trying to deal with the crisis situation. So I think everybody um, should just, you know, be discussing this with their healthcare providers. This is not urgent. It is a balance about you know, being exposed to the crowd versus just waiting until we hope to have this COVID-19 crisis in a better situation in the next few weeks so that we can be better informed how to prepare you for other preventative situations. Another very important question that has been on everyone's mind is we know that COVID-19 does affect uh, supplies, including medications and equipment. So far, we are looking out for everyone. So in our center in Calgary, we can only dispense the Flasacort, uh, which has been a standard medication for most um, patients with DMD. And only one month supply is given at a time. And this is a shared um, reason to make sure that everybody gets the supply that they need. Of course, if there may be situations where you, you feel that this is this is really tough for you. Talk to your healthcare providers. There are other options besides the FLASA cord, especially in handling, you know, illnesses and considering the need for extra steroids in case of stress, surgery, or other major illnesses. I think that the the question about coming up to the clinic appointment is 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 an individual one. If your child is fine and you are able to um, contact your physicians, your neuromuscular clinic nurse, um, and and the rest of the team, and and check up with them. And if you are doing fine uh, at home with your child, it is not necessary for you to come to clinic. As a matter of fact, as you have heard, many clinic appointment, routine clinic appointment are now being canceled. It will change on a week to week basis. So just um, just stay put and and don't be discouraged or worried if your appointment is um, being postponed for the time being. At this point, do I have any other questions from the chat line or is, is, this, um, is this sufficient? Are there other questions from the callers who would like to just raise them to the panel of, of speakers today? Rochelle, do we have any chat questions? No, we don't have any additional questions in the chat box at the moment. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ma. Um, thank you for answering those questions. I'll just take a minute to open it up to the rest of our panelists. Uh, does anyone on the panel have any final comments or uh, parting words before we close? Oh, uh, Dr. Arsu, I wanted to just add an uh, answer to one of the questions. So one of the questions uh, that was posted before the meeting was, 11-year-old uh, uh, with uh, a child with Duchenne's uh, had a pneumo viral pneumonia in December, and would he be at increased risk? And that could be true for other patients as well. Since there has been sufficient time since the viral pneumonia and the tissue would have healed by now, so that would not put that child to, uh, at increased risk. And although, uh, as stated by the first speaker, uh, that uh, this population would maybe at increased risk because of the uh, reasons that were stated, we have uh, been in close uh, touch with our colleagues, respirology colleagues from around the world, including Italy, which has been, uh, as everybody knows, affected very heavily. And they have a big um, group, a big uh, patient uh, uh, group that they follow with Duchenne, and they have not reported uh, any significant issues uh, with their uh, ch with 
for children as general and even uh, in children with underlying uh, conditions, including Duchenne. So I think uh, we have to be very careful and this is an evolving situation. So all the answers, uh, but I don't think we have to be um, too anxious. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ursu. Uh, any other of the panelists want to uh, uh, bring up anything else? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I, I realize we are uh, slightly over time, uh, but I appreciate everyone staying on the line and, uh, and completing uh, our webinar and managing to get through some of those questions. Uh, on behalf of the entire team at Jesse's Journey, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to our panelists uh, for taking the time to provide us with valuable information and address our questions, and also to you, our families, for sharing your questions and participating in this webinar. Uh, we will continue to provide the latest updates um, on our website, uh, information regarding COVID-19 and Duchenne. Uh, so please bookmark our website, jessiesjourney.com forward slash COVID-19 and Duchenne, and also follow us on social media. Finally, I would really like to recognize not only our panelists, but also all of our healthcare workers and researchers, not only within our homeland, but also around the world that are working really hard to address this major public health challenge and to keep our families safe. Um, and please, um, if your question was not answered on this webinar, uh, we will be posting a frequently asked questions on our website along with the recording of this webinar. Uh, but please continue to submit your questions. Uh, we will do our best to make sure that we answer those questions for you uh, and put them up online. So thank you very much. And um, with that, I uh, take care, everyone. Uh, and please stay connected. Goodbye. And with that, we'll end. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>